Hi everyone, I'm delighted to welcome you to this final session in the series of six panel discussions on Oxford and Empire Travel and Translation. For those of you who haven't been before, my name is Ben Grant. I'm a lecturer in English Literature at the University of Oxford's Department for Continuing Education, and I'm the organiser of this series with Siobhan Daly. The series is under the umbrella of the Oxford and Empire Network, which is supported by the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, or TORCH for short, and it's co-sponsored by Kellogg College. And today's session has been entirely organised by Common Ground Oxford, which is a student organisation in the University of Oxford that seeks to examine Oxford's colonial past and engage with activist organisations in the city. The format for this week is more of a discussion than previous uh, panels with shorter individual talks, and there will be plenty of time for questions. So please post any that occur to you in the chat whenever you like. Today's topic is forced migration and colonial legacies, and the speakers are Mira Sabaratnam, Sadia Gardezi, and Jess Wallace. And the session is going to be chaired by Maya Disanayake Pereira and Alice Wong, who are both undergraduate students at Oxford, just in their final year, and they're the co-chairs of Common Ground. So over to you, Maya and Alice. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Ben. Uh, so first, a bit of background on Common Ground and who we are. Uh, so my name is Maya, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm in my final year reading law at Lady Margaret Hall. I'm the outgoing chair of Common Ground Oxford alongside Alice Wong, um, who is in her final year reading English at Queen's College. So Common Ground Oxford is a student-led decolonizing collective based in Oxford. Uh, so in the past, we've worked alongside community activists, academics, and liberation campaigns to lobby the university on its commitments to anti-racism and decolonizing efforts. Uh, so I'm sure you'll hear a bit more about that later, but for now it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce today's panelists. Um, I'll keep it really brief because I am hoping there'll be more time for the panelists themselves to discuss their work in more detail. So first is Dr. Mira Sabaratnam. She is a senior lecturer uh, in international relations in the Department of Politics and International Studies at SOAS. Uh, her research relates to colonial and post-colonial dimensions of world politics, both in theory and in practice. Uh, her recent works include explorations of the workings of the international aid system, and we recommend checking out her recent monograph on decolonizing intervention um, and her other work on racism, Eurocentrism and whiteness in IR and critical pedagogy. So at SOAS, she served as the chair of the Decolonizing SOAS Working Group and on the Academic Senate. And so from this, she has extensive experience in what it means to decolonize um, learning and teaching in the wider university environment. Uh, our next panelist is Sadia Gardezi. She is a journalist and political cartoonist from Pakistan and is the co-founder of the fantastic Project Dastan which is an organization that records oral histories of survivors of the partition of India and Pakistan in 1947. So they do work reconnecting survivors to their ancestral homes across the India, Pakistan and Bangladesh borders. So using um, VR, which is virtual reality and other new technologies. So a bit of background on Project Dastan. It was started in Oxford in 2018 when Sadia was a Weidenfeld Hoffman scholar at St. Edmund Hall or Teddy, and she was reading for an MPhil in modern South Asian studies. At the moment, she is a PhD student and a Chancellor Scholar at Warwick University. And our final panelist, uh, but not least, is Jess Wallace. She's the president of the Oxford branch of STAR which stands for the National Student Action for Refugees Network. Uh, they do really fantastic work across the country from volunteering to campaigning and educating all around supporting and vindicating the rights of refugees. Um, a bit of background on Jess is that she co-ran a local group in Colchester where she's from supporting refugees and is currently working on the Oxford University Sanctuary Campaign, which I'm really excited to hear more about her soon. Uh, so wonderful. I'll hand over to Alice so we can start at the panel. And thank you so much. Really excited. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Maya, and for all our panellists today. So, yeah, we thought we'd start today's panel um, with, you know, the title, the heart of the question of, you know, what is the legacy of colonialism on migration today? And so um, 
I'd like to pass on to Dr. Sabanatron, who's going to kind of outline the legacies of empire and imperialism um, and how they persist today um, and, you know, forced migration historically and the origins of the colonial tradition. So over to you, Dr. Sabanatron. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison and Maya, um, for the invitation and uh, for, for all of your work. I mean, actually, one of the things that we've learned in doing decolonizing work in inverted commas is just how poorly empire and colonialism are actually understood. And so all of these opportunities where we can try and collectively improve our understanding of what happened so that we can understand our present better are incredibly welcome. So thank you for organizing uh, and cultivating this space. So what I'm going to try and do is give you a very broad overview of the relationship between empire and, uh, and migration, particularly forced migration. And in doing that, maybe try and open up some of the questions about today. There are some general pointers that I would want to um, say as a, at the outset. Um, first, I think we should maybe distinguish slightly between colonialism and empire. Um, and the way I'd suggest we do this is through thinking about colonialism as a set of practices of settlement and domination of a particular territorial space and empire as a hierarchical transnational system for administering that space. Um, so this means that colonialism doesn't always happen in the context of empire. It can happen as part of sort of state building and expansion uh, in a more localized sense rather than in a more transnational sense. And empire also does not always have to be colonial. That is to say, you can sustain a hierarchical system of domination and uh, control of sovereignty and so on without physically settling the space as through colonial practices. Um, and when we think about the British Empire, which is in many respects the sort of archetypal empire, you had both things going on. Yes, you had colonial expansion, but you also had a lot of imperial relations that did not involve colonial settlement. So that's the first kind of clarification. Um, the second distinction or clarification we should think about is maybe the difference between modern empires and pre-modern empires. Now, what do I mean by this? Uh, Historians make a great deal about the singularity or the distinctiveness of modernity as a, as a set of um, as a set of practices, really. And by this, they mean the modern territorial nation state. They mean capitalism. They mean industrialization, and so on. Um, and what I'd like to say is that those things are true, and we're going to talk about modern empires. But pre-modern empires also involved a lot of uh, colonial practices, they involved imperial practices, and there was a lot of forced migration, obviously, um, if we think about um, the exodus of the Jews uh, from Egypt, if we think about um, the uh, Indian Ocean slave trade, which I'll, I'll come on to shortly, you've got all sorts of uh, pre-modern forms of empire that also involve mass forcible expulsions or mass forced migrations. And so sometimes we're thinking about degrees of distinction rather than something which is completely new. And that's important because empires, in some respect, always build on practices that exist and then they kind of develop them and extend them in various kinds of ways. So let's turn to this question of the slave trade. Um, when we think of the slave trade, we typically think of the transatlantic slave trade, which is the archetypical, uh, in a way, most profound, most uh, violent form of forced migration, right? Maybe 11 million people, a most recent estimates suggest, uh, were transported, kidnapped uh, from various parts of Africa and shipped over to the Americas, generally understood. Um, and this historically many would definitely say it's in a, in a league of its own. However, there was a massive Indian Ocean slave trade in some respects maybe still is um, forms of uh, forcible uh, migration in this space. Uh, involving enslaved people from Africa and um, taking place over many, many centuries. And if we compare and contrast across these two massive slave trades, um, again, the Indian Ocean one in, involves millions of people, uh, we see some differences which give us a little uh, flavor of this distinction between, if you like, the pre-modern and the modern. In the Indian Ocean, um, the slave trade went on a lot longer. It went on you know, at least a couple of thousand years. Um, it didn't involve the mass movement of people uh, bought in bulk, if you like, but the slow uh, trickling of people out towards various parts of the Indian Ocean. And it didn't involve the kind of racial sequestering or the racial division uh, that came to strongly characterize the transatlantic slave trade. So there's lots of examples, for example, in the Indian Ocean slave trade 
of peoples of African descent who have either been able to marry into a family or to work their way out of slavery into general society. Uh, and we see a number of Afro-descended communities around the Indian Ocean region uh, today that are part of this earlier um, element. Now, that's not to say that these weren't incredibly violent uh, situations, but it's just to say that you have not just one or the other, but sometimes degrees. So what about the modern imperial system? And I'm here, I'm talking about the Europe-centered system that starts in the sort of 17th century and goes on um, essentially till the mid 20th century. There's a couple of things then I would flag as being central to this when we think about forced migration. The first is, of course, the invention of the category of race as a distinguishing characteristic. So when we think about how people were enslaved and how they were trafficked, not just from the African continent, but from South Asia and from China and so on, um, racial hierarchies were central to understanding why they were selected, how they were treated and the rights and entitlements that they had upon arrival in whatever space that they're looking at. Um, and even the idea of whiteness itself is part of the story of migration, right? It's invented in the new world to make sense of these new social categories of people that are coming out of uh, Europe in, in dribs and drabs, but they want to distinguish from these people who are coming out of Africa. Second, we think about the idea of modern citizenship and modern nationhood as being related also to the colonial project. Um, Radhika Mungia has got a new book out, uh, which is uh, fantastically interesting about uh, India and migration and empire. And the argument there is really that the conception of what it means to be a national and a nation state um, is developed in large part through the racial categories developed through empire. So in this genealogy, race and nation are very closely interrelated um, and often substitute for each other, particularly when people want to make racist policies that don't look racist. As in they, they invoke the category of nation as a means of formally discriminating. And her example there is about the attempt to manage Indian inward migration into Canada in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century. Third, Modern empires were also liberal in important ways. What this means is that they promoted economic liberalism, they promoted the end of um, feudalism, right, in, and some sense of free waging, uh, free wages, and they also promoted various ideas of humanity and rights and all those other things that we associate with uh, liberalism. But they had to manage the contradiction, right, that contradiction of unfreedom and freedom or slavery and freedom, um, which was central to how these empires worked. Because on the one hand, they want to promote liberal order, they want to try and promote openness, mobility, rights and so on. On the other hand, they're dependent on the exploitation and management of different populations. Um, so race is one way of managing that story. Debt is another one, right? So when we see the uh, official outlawing of the slave trade in the, in the British territories, it's replaced quite quickly with a system of indenture where people sign contracts under various forms of duress, either economic or um, uh, physical. And those contracts mean that they're then transported, often in very similar conditions to the enslaved, into different areas where they have to uh, work off these debts often for life. So, the idea that people contract themselves into debt and that being part of their forcible migration stories is also a legacy of, of empire that comes through. The last couple of things I'll say is that there was a period of high imperialism. So from the late 19th to the early 20th century where borders and nations and uh, essentially stoppages to mobility were very minimal partly because of the invention of the steamship, you have mass migration around the world into different spaces. And also partly because the system of passports is not really developed at this point. And the emphasis and the belief on free movement is much stronger than the emphasis on control and borders and, and nations. Um, so there is a period in which empire actually facilitates large amounts of free movement around the world or free in inverted commas, large amounts of movement. And that comes to an end with the First World War. So that's something we can think about as well, those interconnectedness. And finally, just to sum up, because I've been speaking for a while, but um, to summarize that relationship then of colonialism and migration, colonialism, modern colonialism is integral to the functioning of modern nation states, to capitalism, to nationalism, to war and militarism, to thinking about how we understand race and all of these categories. 
And these are all products of the imperial project, particularly the 18th and 19th century in terms of how they're articulated. So when we look at forced migration today and how we imagine nations, how we imagine borders and how we imagine categories of deserving and undeserving migrants, these are to some extent bound up with our imperial imaginaries, imaginaries. And these throughout time have also engaged forms of resistance, which hopefully is something that we'll come on to in the discussion, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really excellent. There's so much detailed information and it was a really good, like kind of almost a whistle stop tour. I feel like I've learned so much, so I really appreciate that. Um, we've had one comment asking about um, the resources and books reference. So um, I'll just say now that, you know, anything that is referenced today and um, we'll probably collate at the end and then perhaps Torch Network can kind of like pop that on the website or something like that. So yeah, don't worry. Um, so now I'd just like to ask whether Sadia or Jess would like to um, chime in in this section, but no worries if not. I think Mira gave us so much to think about. <laughs> I'd love to follow on from, I thought it was a really interesting point that was made about um, how debt sort of is so closely linked to colonialism, especially because a massive thing that STAR is running at the moment is this University of Sanctuary campaign. And this is looking at getting refugees to higher education, which I think we're going to talk about later. But um, the whole thing of asylum seekers being charged international fees is sort of, you know, the, this idea of debt is still very much perpetuated. Um, and it, I think it just really does show how these legacies of colonialism like are, are present um, in society at large, but also in these higher institutions. Yeah, wonderful. I'm really looking forward to actually getting on to that discussion later. Um, perhaps you could tell us more about the um, the campaign then. Yeah. And Sadia, would you like to say anything? No worries if not. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, in fact, when I uh, start talking about what Project Dastan is, some of um, the things that uh, Dr. Sabaratnam has said are you know very relevant to us and it provides a context for projects like ours who are working in this kind of very real world idea of what the archive is and, and contemporary activism, um, especially, you know, the, the issue of passports. So we're right now working on an animation that uh, kind of brings forward the point of what bureaucracy was like in 1947 um, uh, during partition and how uh, bureaucratic practices during the time basically um, took away identities of uh, partition migrants and you know uh, basically you have people being turned into pieces of paper and that's kind of like a, our absurd analogy and we're also looking at um, the diversity of uh, forced migration experiences, you know, it wasn't just uh, uh, the, you know, we've had a focus on in, in the case of partition in India on the, uh, the uh, division of Punjab and then Kashmir, uh, but then there's so many other experiences, um, for example, experiences of the Bay of Bengal community, experiences of people from uh, Burma, Sri Lanka, Singapore, we're all connected to this one territory and because of bureaucratic practices and passports there um, also had to kind of lose uh, their um, way of life, their professions and kind of kind of settle because these were seafaring communities. Um, so I think it's it's um, uh, what um, Dr. Sabaratnam has said is an, like, provides an excellent overview of the context of empire and colonialism and especially a, a big grounding for uh, you know uh, activist projects. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, just again, um, Mira, it was really excellent. Um, so I think if, if there aren't any more comments, we can move on to the second question, which Maya will take. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, thanks so much, Mira. I really especially enjoyed the, like, pointing out that tension and contradiction in kind of liberal society, um, these like liberal values of, you know, free market economics and, you know, kind of humanity and dignity. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Wonderful. Uh, so the next kind of framing question, we're going to kind of dig a bit deeper into the lived experiences of those affected by forced migration and kind of colonial legacy, so both kind of historical and um, modern. And it would be really wonderful if we could bring in your slides, Sadia, a um, bit of backdrop on Project Dastan. Yeah, um, I thought I would share some um, something more visual. Um, to tell you about uh, some of the work Project Dastan does and how that links into these uh, these um, discussions of decolonization and forced migration. Um, so I've titled this presentation, Can We Go Back Home Again? And this is about uh, 
uh, partition um, migrants who have contacted us, Project Dastan, um, and talked to us about their experiences of their life in um, uh, undivided India before partition and their desires to go back and see their ancestral villages. So this is a picture of Saida Siddiqui. Uh, she, very sadly, she passed away this year. Um, and she had this long-standing desire since uh, she left Lucknow um, in the 1950s after partition to visit Lucknow again. And uh, we know because of how borders are drawn, because of the conflict that exists between India and Pakistan, it is very difficult for people to go back home. And, and, and as you have seen with the, the current uh, political situations, every year it seems to get harder to cross the border to get a visa to go back. And that's compounded for these former refugees in terms of their age and the other restrictions they have in, in, in actual mobility. Um, so this is Saida. She migrated from Lucknow in the 1950s. Um, she was studying to be a doctor in um, uh, King George College there. Um, and she moved to Karachi and Karachi was never home for her. Like she, obviously the family settled there, but it was uh, never really, um, didn't get that feeling from home. And she told us she thinks of Lucknow every day. Um, so Saida's journey was a journey that we would obviously um, uh, demarcate as a forced migration, but it didn't have those stereotypical elements of partition migrants of violence and, and them being uh, harassed by, by um, uh, whatever groups at that time were, you know, um, um, killing, marauding, etc. Um, so she had a relatively safe journey. She went a few years after partition, but it points to two facts that forced migration didn't have to be physically violent and migrations were, as uh, Vazira Zamidar says, it's a long migration when we talk about partition. All these migrations didn't just happen in 1947. They continued on in the 1950s as bureaucratic practices also uh, started changing and laws in these countries started changing. Um, in contrast, we also have uh, spoken to people who have more of these traditional narratives of partition where um, this is um, Iqbaluddin and Badruddin, um, their cousins who migrated from Indian Punjab and went to Pakistan. Pakistan, and they have a very harrowing tale of the journey they took on foot by train. Um, the, they have stories of the bodies that they saw in the trains uh, during partition, how they were chased, how their villages were set on fire. So these two very different um, narratives, uh, are, they're just examples that exist where we have this one narrative of uh, a trauma of loss of home, but then we also have it in, in Iqbaluddin and Madruntin's case of actual physical violence and terror that these people faced. Um, so I'll just introduce you to our, our project and the idea is, can we go back home? Can these refugees, uh, former refugees, uh, partition survivors, um, witnesses actually go back home? So what Project Dastan does is we hear their stories um, about their uh, ancestral homes and we try to reconnect them back using virtual reality. Uh, and the idea is to kind of, in our interviews, in our conversations with them, not focus on the, the actual trauma that they felt maybe, but focus on ideas of shared cultural heritage that they may have had, the communities that they were once part of, what home was like and what childhood was like um, and it's it's a, in a sense kind of an effort to give this generation some closure and create this link back with history and also introduce their families and younger generations um, to um, the stories of partition, the stories of their grandparents and kind of create this movement where we can once again talk about um, um, the this archive and kind of bring the archive out from uh, folders and files and data into this very, uh, you know, emotional and impactful visual um, uh, story. Um, so we have our social impact program. We have by, uh, up till now taken around um, 12 partition witnesses back through use, the use of virtual reality and also other connections through WhatsApp or you know if anybody has still survived in their local villages and I just try to reconnect them. Um, so this is just one uh, picture that I wanted to show you of uh, the VR experience. Obviously, you know, this is going to um, uh, be a little different, but we give them an immersive experience. So they're standing in a 360 environment, which we've gone, we have, um, feel, uh, we do a lot of field work where we go and film the locations that they've told us about, and they can basically stand in their hometown, whether it's a mosque, or uh, it's a field, it's their home, it's the roof of their home, it's a, it's a fort, whatever they've told us that they miss and they want to see again. 
uh, we try to show it to them. Um, uh, as um, uh, this is our website, basically you can see um, uh, the variety of experiences that we've recorded. And also there's some uh, 360 experiences. If you have VR glasses or the Google card put at home, you can uh, kind of uh, see what we're trying to do. Uh, we also have a fully immersive 3D experience for people um, younger generations who who want to engage more in this subject, um, which we will which will be ready in two months, um, where we're trying to put you in the 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 shoes of a partition migrant, um, so you can actually experience maybe what happened in 1947 and 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 go on a migration yourself to kind of um, really uh, connect people with what happened um, in, in the context of Indian Pakistan and, and the experience of a migration. And um, as COVID-19 hit and our uh, fieldwork had to be stopped, uh, we also engaged in uh, a 2D animation project, which is looking at untold stories of uh, partition, where we're looking at stories like the story of bureaucracy, the story of Bay of Bengal communities, um, narratives of women's experiences of partition, which are, we feel that are less um, amplified in um, uh, partition studies or the general discussion around partition um, uh, here. So did, did we take these uh, part partition survivors back? So Saida, we unfortunately could not take back. We had, we created the 360 experience of her home but uh, Saida passed away um, a month ago and because of uh, COVID-19 restrictions, we weren't able to go into her home and show her the experience. Iqbaluddin and Badruddin did get to see their home again. Um, we did this uh, take back experience earlier last year. Um, but there are some caveats that I wanted to talk about when we're talking about forced migration and you know this artificial return home. Um, one of them is that memory is very difficult to replicate. When we're speaking to people, um, Badruddin, for example, came from a small village in Punjab called Mesa Tibba. And when we got there, we realized that the village wasn't there anymore. Those people had migrated. It was just green fields and trees. Um, so memory is something very difficult for um, us to, to uh, replicate or show it back to them. Things have changed. So the caveat is that we can take you back home, but maybe it's not the home that you, you knew as home. Um, uh, uh, an added issue is um, that I like, it, we these are forced migrations, but also the fact that it's also enforced migration. By that, I mean that projects like ours exist because of how migration has been enforced, because of the political and military aspects of uh, modern statehood. Um, these people continue to be kind of refugees in their minds um, because they can actually never go visit their home again. Um, and the third thing I want to say is about the diversity of forced migration experiences that trauma doesn't have to be a physical trauma. It's it's not just the fact that there were trains being burnt on their way to from Pakistan to India or India to Pakistan. Trauma is just quite literally leaving your home, leaving your friends, never, never just the idea of never being able to go back home again. And I think um, what we're trying to do is create that empathetic uh, material so that we can talk about these things and have more people connect to um, uh, the stories of refugees. Um, we, we are living in a world right now where many of these migrations are ongoing. Um, it's still a world full of warfare and conflict. So partition and what happened in 1947 is not too long back in the past. And we, there's many lessons that we can learn from what happened to these communities and what are what is happening to whether it's Syrians or the Rohingyas, et cetera, today. Um, so that's my very brief uh, uh, kind of intervention into forced migration and our experiences with forced migration. Um, I just wanted to show you this lovely image, 3D image. It's been, it's been made 2D um, so that you can view it, but it's a 3D tour of the Gomti River in Lucknow. And the sad fact that it's, it's not because it, it you know, Saida Siddiqui, one of our partition witnesses, wanted to take this journey again. She would have seen this 360 uh, experience and rode uh, a boat on the Gomti River again. But there's so many other ways that uh, migration is forced and enforced that um, some of our journeys uh, back home are just impossible. Um, so I'll end here um, and um, uh, leave it to the group to, you know, if you have any questions, if you want to um, discuss this more, we can take that up later. 
Thanks so much, Sadia. That was a really beautiful presentation. And I really, I really back the work that you do, like beginning from a place of compassion and empathy. Um, yeah, that was really wonderful. Um, I'd like to hand over to Jess, if you have kind of thoughts on the question of kind of, um, you know, press, present refugee mindsets and the campaign work that you do. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to say, I think the amazing thing about Sadia's project is this whole focus on home, which I think is so often forgotten in current narratives. So I think it's like a direct corollary of um, the, like British Empire and these traditions of colonialism that um, there's this assumption that Britain is incredible and Britain is the place that everyone wants to be. And it's interesting because I, I've talked to like refugees in Calais and stuff who tell me that Britain is incredible and it's the best place ever. And I'm sort of like, well, why? And there are all these expectations that just aren't true. And I do think that is left over from these ideas of empire. But at the same time, there are a lot of people that I meet in Britain who um, just want to go home. And there's this, this whole idea that refugees really, really want to come to Britain. And although that is true for a lot of people, a lot of people would much rather be at home and they, they do love their home countries. And I think it's quite a common misconception to just say, that Britain is this incredible place. There's a lot of work to be done. And I think that does start with um, recognizing how important home is to refugees and how important it is to, to remember and, and to value where they've come from. Yeah, that's really wonderful. I totally agree. Like in the, in the media, often kind of media narratives of refugees are really homogenous and like objectifying, just really dehumanizing. Um, without taking into account the fact that, you know, this whole, um, there are some really artificial narratives, both the kind of return home narrative, where like, you know, upon return to their ancestral um, land, then all of their problems are fixed. Like, you know, like he said, it can just be fields and grass at that point. And also this, you know, Britain is best. And, you know, everyone wants to be here. Everyone wants to be us. Um, it's really wonderful we're able to discuss these and kind of deconstruct them. Um, Mira, if you have any thoughts, we'd love to hear them. Um, well, firstly, maybe just to second the uh, applause for Sadia's project. I mean, it, it's amazing, absolutely fantastic. And um, I imagine extremely moving. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, Eleanor Newbegin, um, with um, a theatre company uh, was working on some plays, one of which was about, if you like, the lived experience of partition. It's absolutely harrowing and um, sort of devastating for just to sit there as an audience member. And um, these human stories, the amount of suffering involved in actually wrenching yourself out of a place because you have to, or because you might die, or because, you know, well, essentially because you might die or something worse, um, is, is something which we, yes, we do continuously overlook. Of course, the public discourse is very much about scroungers and people coming to take advantage of Britain's generosity um, but everybody who leaves their home even with you know whether they were forced at the point of a gun or not has this has this wrench. Edward Said's essay on exile is one that I regularly uh, set for my students and it's about that state of exile as being one in which one is constantly kind of on the one hand kind of yearning but on the other hand out of place and it's a very it's a peculiar form of suffering even when it's not just material in terms of not having the things that you owned but uh, psychological in terms of being displaced is uh, profoundly affecting that's a really beautiful piece uh, edward sides like that's a really wonderful way of putting it um yeah, really wonderful. Uh, I think if we have more thoughts on this point, we can continue. But if not, we can move on to the next kind of framing question, which Alice will present. Yeah, wonderful. Um, okay, so we thought the next kind of idea or topic that we could think about um, was government policy. Um, and essentially, um, whether, you know, we see traces of these, I think we've already mentioned it, you know, traces of these colonial mindsets um, in government policy in like European or ex-colonial countries today. Um, and as we've been sort of talking about, like how this like affects the lived experiences of migrants or refugees. Um, so would anyone like to start us off or I could, I could pick. <laughs> Um, Mira, would you 
Do you want to I was actually encouraging you to pick, but that's fine. <laughs> I can start us off. Um, yes, I think we maybe might disaggregate a few different elements of what we mean by a colonial mindset. So obviously, it seems obvious, but racism is part of the colonial infrastructure. Um, but it's not necessarily the same as it was during the period of colonization. Um, and so there's been an evolution in racialized discourse and particularly with the overt displacement of the category of race uh, as, as part of that. Um, and so what you see, if you like, is still a, you know, a sort of distaste or a disdain for the other or the people who are seen as less entitled, less worthy, uh, less able to be assimilated into um, uh, British culture and even you know, in the imagination of what Britain is as well. Um, so that element is definitely there. But there's also an element about, um, more broadly speaking, sort of imperial entitlement and entitlement to space. Um, one of the things that I think higher, highlights, if you like, the hierarchical character of this mindset is the ways in which migration is viewed when it's outward migration of wealthy people um, from the global north, as opposed to inward um, migration of um, people from the global south, um, that classic distinction between the expat and the migrant, right? The expat is also a figure who won't assimilate and won't learn the language and all the rest of it. But um, when it's done by people from the global south, it's seen as much more problematic um, and so on. So yes, there is a kind of colonial mindset, but British opinion in particular, I think ebbs and flows on this matter. And I think it's important to situate the hostility that we see currently towards migrants and refugees in a change in mindset, particularly over the last 20 to 30 years, um, where there's been, in some respects, an intensification of, well, really the last 20 years, there's been an intensification of uh, xenophobic discourse in particular. Um, that's not to say that, you know, the 90s and the 2000s were amazing humanitarian times, but we certainly have seen a, um, uh, a change in the criminalization of refugee status, in putting people into detention centers, into the kinds of hoops and hurdles that are put in the way of legal migration, um, such that it was easier when, you know, members of my family fled the civil war in Sri Lanka. Um, those who arrived in the sort of late eighties, the situation was incomparably easier for them than it is now for people uh, fleeing um, persecution. Brilliant. Thank you for that summary. That was very um, interesting. I was wondering actually when you're kind of talking about how government policy has changed and this kind of, you know, sense of xenophobia, um, whether Jess, like you've any interactions you've had with refugees or kind of, you know, the stories that they're telling now and how they've been treated and the kind of the work that you do to support um, refugees. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the whole hostile environment has had a massive impact on the way refugees are treated and like their experiences in society. And I think people don't realize quite how deep it goes. So in, you know, in doing asylum applications, um, even the paperwork that you choose, there are all these really fine distinctions between which paperwork you're meant to do. And it's really hard to work out. I remember like we worked with someone who was coming from Canada and um, so sort of didn't, didn't face the same barriers someone coming from a country like Syria or something was facing and was really, really struggling to work out what paperwork she should fill out. And like really small things like this and the, the, the like insane length of time the asylum process takes just, just add to this idea of a hostile environment. But I don't think it's something that's unique to Britain either. So something that really struck me um, in Calais was that the French police would go around and they'd like at night would cut the soles out of shoes. And this was like unnecessary. And, you know, you could tell it wasn't just that they were enforcing the law it was they were enforcing this this sense of hostility and this whole sense of you shouldn't be here and I think it's really harmful the whole idea of a hostile environment and um, I think we just need to remember that there's a difference between like legality and what is allowed and these limits that you have to impose and then this unnecessary addition of hostility I think it's really damaging yeah definitely and um yeah, that sounds really hostile. What you were saying about Calais, I didn't, I didn't know that things like that were happening. But it's it's definitely so difficult for so many migrants. Um, Sadia, would you maybe bring the kind of 
um, South Asia or India, Pakistan perspective to this? Yeah, I think uh, the question on governmentality is such a big question that I think all of us, that's why we were kind of resisting. It is a big question because um, for, for me, um, fixing the foreign policy issues with India and Pakistan is not something I can do. It's not something that, that you know, a small uh, social um, movement or a small activist group can do. Uh, it's uh, to some extent, these, these big movements between governments are kind of beyond our control. And we, we have to also sometimes rely, especially for Project Dastan, I can't say it for, for most of the projects, we kind of rely on the tolerance of uh, officials so that we can do our field work, so that we can actually go into people's homes or go to these monuments and 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 take these pictures, right? Um, but then there's also the the narrative or the myth of partition that is constantly in the minds of Indians and Pakistanis, and that's also structuring the way that we see the other um, uh, and uh, the way that we kind of allow um, uh, our our project to function. Um, so before. Um, Two years ago, when we were doing field work in India, for example, and we're going into people's home asking for, you know, do you remember so and so person? Do you know where this building is? Uh, we were welcome to a large extent. Um, I feel now we're still doing field work. We're back into the field. Um, the sentiments of people have changed. They're a lot, lot uh, are more reluctant to talk to us about Pakistanis or Muslims, right? Um, so this ebb and flow obviously keeps happening in politics between India and Pakistan, where sometimes it's it's okay to talk about these things as a space and suddenly opens up and then the space closes very fast. And I think India is right now in that closed space. Um, but then there's sparks of these uh, 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 spaces where, for example, in Pakistan for um, a Sikh uh, people to do um, their, um, um, to come to uh, the Gurdwaras and do their um, uh, pilgrimage in Pakistan, Pakistan opened something called the Qatar. Uh, Qatarpur corridor, which allowed people uh, to enter into Pakistan for for religious purposes. So we have these bright sparks as, as well, and and for us it's like just uh, absolutely unpredictable. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the next six months, and if we'll still be in the field, if we'll be able to talk about these things or not, etc. And most of the projects in in India and Pakistan that are uh, doing things for friendship or some type of uh, cultural exchange have see this ebb and flow and are constantly constantly subjected to uh, uh, government policies about what to do. Um, I mean, our project is based on just the fact that it's very difficult to get a visa if you're Pakistani or Indian and vice versa. And I, uh, for example, know that with my profile, uh, right now it's going to be very difficult for me if I ever want to go to India. So we have this, this divide um, that uh, doesn't really need to exist in a sense that Project Dastan should not exist. It shouldn't be that difficult to just go to your village, you know, and we exist because of the the, the governmentality that exists uh, uh, um, around us. Uh, and I'll just give you a small anecdote that I have an Indian, I have many Indian friends and I, I don't know if you guys have noticed that Indian Pakistanis get along amazingly when they're, you know, abroad and studying at universities. And I have this friend in India who uh, goes to Amritsar very uh, often. Uh, and Amritsar is very close to my hometown, which is Lahore. It's a short, short, short drive. It's right across the border. Um, and when he's in Amritsar, he'll generally text me that I can listen to City FM 89, which is a Lahore radio station. And he'll be listening to uh, a radio in Lahore. But we can kind of never see each other across the border. And there's just this absurdity that exists because of governmentality and because of uh, you know the way that we've carried forth um, these ideas of who an Indian and who in Pakistani is and, and and I know I haven't really spoken about colonization and empire and how those things get, get carried through uh, but um, they do it is coming out of how the British Raj left um, uh, this territory and exited and and the 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 politics and the networks that were already created, you know, the fact that why Pakistani governmentality or Pakistani military is so different from what uh, what's happening in India, the way democracy is in India, India is different from democracy in Pakistan. These are all links in how colonization happened, who became part of the British military, who, who was the Nawab at the time and their link, whether it was a princely state, whether it was not, did they have an electorate or not. And those were decisions that were taken during the time of empire and colonization. So there is our direct linkages 
from then to today that we can clearly see when we look at immigration policy, migration issues, whether it's, you know, Pakistan has a big um, uh, migrant Afghan population and those colonial links that uh, linkages and patterns that existed of government in northern Pakistan continue to structure how we view and how we treat Afghan migrants today. Um, so I think it's a very, very big question. And I think I've said a lot, but obviously it does uh, uh, really impact the work of, of activists and, and social movements. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That was that was so interesting. And it was really nice to kind of get another perspective because I feel like often with these days, often because we're in Britain, you know, we often feel, think about Britain, European um, government policy and sometimes forget, um, you know, ex-colonial countries. Um, but just because I'm a little bit aware of time, um, we're probably going to move straight on to the um, final section now. Um, so over to you, Maya. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I just want to say that was a really fantastic discussion. I especially love the... Um, I always love bringing up the kind of expat versus migrant distinction and this kind of weird um, place they hold in our heads. Um, but yeah, it's really fantastic. So then our kind of final framing question kind of brings, we're like kind of focusing in even more into universities and kind of higher education institutions specifically. Uh, so kind of where do Oxford and you know, other universities, including SOAS, um, fit into this discussion? So obviously, um, universities have a massive role in kind of, you know, generating the people who are, you know, producing government policy, you know, disproportionately so with universities like Oxford and Cambridge. Um, but, you know, how do, how do we think about this? How do they shape policy both directly and indirectly in the kind of, not just the students, but also the data and the research that's generated in higher education institutions? Um, so it would be lovely, um, can I hand over to Mira first for your, your thoughts? Um, I mean, I, I have to say, I think some of the best work at universities happening around this area is from student, student groups and student activist groups. I mean, I have personally learned so much from the SOAS um, detainee support group and um, other groups. And I think in part because one of the nice things about university, apart from the very many nice things about university, is that you have the opportunity to work with other people to try and remake your own realities. And that sounds a bit dramatic. But in the case of migration, where the discourse around the undesirability of migrants and asylum seekers is so profoundly ingrained, um, when you see student groups doing things which are completely the opposite and saying things which sound outrageous, like, no borders, no nations, stop deportations. This is, um, this is really important actually, because it's a space where you can think outside the box and have the conversations that you can't have in a mass media kind of context in which the public sphere is completely unsupportive of. Um, and you also have the opportunity as students to do the kind of work that Jess has been doing, go to Calais, actually meet asylum seekers, meet people who have um, experienced the system and understand it from a much more human dimension. And I think if this was all that universities were doing, this would still be very valuable. Um, of course, there are colleagues doing other important work. Some of those um, elements are trying to have a more uh, empirically based um, set of policies around migration and asylum in particular. And so some of them will look at the economic benefits that migrants bring or the actual impact of migration on say housing or uh, employment or so on. I have to say that government policy in this area does not particularly seem evidence-based as in many areas, it's not actually very evidence-based, but particularly in this one, this is purely ideological. This is government, um, overspending and over talking about an area which concretely doesn't have that much impact on the lives of everyday people, right? The levels of migration that people think there are compared to the levels of migration that there actually are hugely out of whack. Um, but what it is, is a way, and this is, I mean, to think about the wider political order, it's a way of um, uh, sort of focusing on something so that you don't necessarily have to talk about the other things, right? So this is an area on which there's political consensus that, that this thing happens. So for universities, yes, you can try and build the evidence base, you can try and research in the area, but I actually think it's the student work which is connecting with the human side of it and 
thinking and pushing in other directions that I am learning is actually more important than the more conventional academic stuff, I think. Thank you, Ray. That's such a um, that's such a wonderful perspective, because I don't know about um, Jess and Alice, but um, so with Common Ground, a lot of the work that we do is kind of, um, you know, kind of identifying and lobbying around the flaws in how like university kind of faculty and how you know policy is being kind of executed when it comes to anti-racism and decolonizing but um you're absolutely right that there is you know such a incredible incredible value in the work that kind of student activists and um, academics and you know other people taking part are doing in kind of envisioning this kind of a radical future you know no borders no nations etc it's really um i'm really glad that you brought that up it made me feel much happier um because often we kind of get stuck in a spiral of looking at all the things that are wrong but that's really lovely um it would be lovely to hand over to jess because i it would be great to kind of look at what the institutions are doing i remember you alluded earlier to the um sanctuary university sanctuary um campaign so it would be great to hear your thoughts yeah so i mean i completely agree that student work can have such a massive impact on sort of the discussions we have and the ways that institutions treat refugees and asylum seekers and I think the University of Sanctuary campaign does embody that so the whole idea of becoming a University of Sanctuary is based on both these practical um, policies that you can implement so having a scholarship for refugees having bursaries like opening up employment opportunities to the refugee community and things like this but also so much is predicated on just the concept of being a welcoming place and somewhere where um, you value contributions from people from different cultures from different countries and that you have these discussions so um, there's events like refugee week which are all about campaigning and just getting the conversation started and I think there is so much to be said for just starting off these conversations and I think you can often underestimate the significance that that, that can have so the, the sort of first move that we're doing in this University of Sanctuaries campaign is that we have a petition that's going and we're trying to get students to just sign this petition to sort of commit their support to their campaign. And I think sometimes it can often be assumed that a petition doesn't do that much. But I mean, I've realised as well how important it is to have student backing and to have to just be able to show the university, look, this is a pressing issue and you have students who really care about this. It makes a big difference in sort of your bargaining power. And um, yeah, we're also talking with individual colleges because the difference with Oxford is that you can't really go straight to being a university of sanctuary. You've got to be a college of sanctuary first. So Mansfield and Somerville are really leading the way on this. And they've, I think they've submitted their applications to become um, colleges of sanctuary. But by sort of, um, we're hoping to set up action groups in each colleges and getting the conversation going in every college, it, it will create hopefully a really powerful source of momentum so I think um, in general, I think students shouldn't underestimate the very significance of just starting a conversation and understanding the importance of these issues, because I think it really can help and, and also help connect to the community. So there are some fantastic organisations in Oxford, like Asylum Welcome, Jackery, WEA, all doing absolutely brilliant work. And I mean, I, I'm not going to lie, I didn't even know much about them before I started properly working with STAR. And it's just building these connections, which are really, really valuable um, for everyone in the community, I feel. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Um, yeah, really fantastic. Like, fingers crossed for Worcester and LMH. But um, I totally agree. We sometimes underestimate as individuals the kind of political sovereignty and power we have as a collective. Um, when it comes to kind of petitions, open letters, etc., kind of just um, even existing like as a voice of opposition to like a hostile environment is a really important part of the like discussion and part of the movement continuing forward. Um, they are really wonderful. Thank you, Jess. Um, and Sadia, so Project Dastan actually started, you know, right. What I say here, I'm actually in Belgium right now, but you know, here in Oxford, uh, you know, um, where torches and common ground are. Uh, so it would be wonderful to kind of hear your insight into the kind of how um, torch, not torch, how Project Destin began, and your uh, just your thoughts on the question. 
Well, please feel free. Yeah, so Project Hassan did begin in Oxford in 2018. We were all students here. Um, so we had um, uh, basically it was just a discussion between Indian and Pakistani students about their grandparents and just the fact of how difficult it was for them to visit each other countries when their ancestral lands or their uh, homes were in that countries. Um, so I think the 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 one of our main concerns has been that um, the history of uh, uh, the British Raj, the history of the the division of India and its uh, um, um, and partition um, are basically kind of um, categorized in something that is either area studies or post-colonial studies, and we kind of have, have left it out of the mainstream, um, and especially in history. Um, so one of our concerns is that this this is not global history or area studies. This is also British history, um, and therefore the the history of uh, of colonization has to become part of uh, the discussion of history in Britain and, and especially in schools and, and colleges. So one of the, the um, groups that we're part of is called the Partition Education Group that is kind of lobbying parliament to um, um, kind of not change, but modify GCSE curriculum so that this the partition is is uh, specifically recognized. And we're also now uh, going to work with something called Colonial Hangover, which is a, a group of students and and teachers at Warwick who go out into the the Birmingham, Coventry, and the um, Black Country area to schools to kind of talk about decolonization, to talk about um, empire, and and we are kind of hoping to provide them the partition component of this discussion um, um, to kind of like, because uh, there, there are a lot of uh, South Asian uh, ancestry communities in this area. So we are all very interested in, in the conversation around um, education and um, uh, uh, coloni colonialism and happy to be a part of, of these discussions, especially, you know, this forum um, at Common Ground and Torch. Uh, so I think it is very important um, what is happening in the higher education space and the discussions that students and, and professors are engaging in, not exactly as Mira talked about uh, the government policy and the ideology that exists there, but just generally like we have found a lot of support at, at universities. I mean, we started at Oxford. One of our first grants was from Teddy Hall, which is my college, who kind of recognized the value in this and that kind of started us off on a kind of a long journey where right now, for example, the British Council's um, Digital Innovation Fund uh, has given us a very big grant to do our animations and collaborate with a Pakistani artist so that, you know, this is something that can exist in the British cultural and museum space. Um, so yeah, yeah. That is so exciting. Oh, I can't wait to see the, the results of that. Very cool. Um, yeah, I totally agree. I think that, um, yeah, we, again, we, well, I personally sometimes underestimate the effect of um, changing just the culture of, you know, the university environment can have on, like, you know, in terms of ripples into wider society. Um, I recently learned that um, Christian Cole, who was the first um, Black graduate of Oxford, he was a contemporary of Cecil Rhodes. So they were kind of, you know, trotting around Oxford at the same time, you know, Cecil Rhodes who famously kind of had very solid beliefs in, you know, Britons and you know the, the being the, the top top dogs, top top race ethnicity um, of the world, and going to share it with the rest of the world. Um, but yeah, so basically, we've come a very long way from um, even even five ten years ago. Um, it's really wonderful to hear the work that Project Dasan has done and to hear its kind of origin story. So that's really fantastic. Um, if Jess and Mira have any other kind of thoughts we'd like to weigh in, that would be really wonderful. But if not, I think we've kind of covered all of our framing questions. Feel free to, oh yeah, please. Sorry, I just actually wanted to say something about um, uh, maybe university is a place where we can also have, if you like, ethical questions about humanism after empire so one of the things that's happened in terms of the debates that have been unfolding around empire and imperial legacies is that um, the paternalistic character of if what classic liberal humanitarianism has been widely discredited and i think that is something that a lot of uh, younger people would want to um, challenge these days and well, not just younger people but those of us who are thinking about these issues are, are looking to challenge 
Um, but lots of people don't like the alternatives, right? Because at, at very least liberal humanism or liberal humanitarianism provides a framework through which um, engagement with refugees and migrants and so on can take place, right? You've got your Geneva Conventions, you've got your um, uh, protocols around uh, refugees and international law and so on. And so um, the question is like, what can replace or what can enhance or transform those ethics and those values into something that is more appropriate to the 21st uh, century, where you are engaging with, um, uh, with others and you, you're looking for, if you like, maybe a more progressive um, outcome, but you're not wanting to use that language of progress in, in, in the old sense. And so I think universities are a space where people can try to reground that sense of what values drive an engagement with the problem of forced migration and the problem of refugees and so on. Um, and through a decolonial lens, I think a lot of it has to do with actually going back to the historical record and understanding the co-constitution of the modern world through these processes of empire and how, if you like, the famines and the well, you know, and the wars and so on that happen in one part of the world being interconnected integrally with other parts of the world, either through being in the same kind of food supply chain as we saw with the Bengal famine, or as being in um, part of the sort of wider military infrastructure as we see with Yemen and the UK and the arms industry and Saudi Arabia and so on. Um, so understanding our mutual entanglement as a, as a framing for how and why we engage with people around the world, I think is a productive conversation that is happening at universities. Amazing, that's really um, fascinating insight. Thank you, Mira. Um, wonderful. I think we might be all right to move to kind of other kind of additional questions that have come up. Um, Alice, if you have any to hand. Yeah, so you've had lots of comments and questions um, and engagement, which has been really great. Um, but this one's from uh, near the beginning, and this one um, was probably to you, Mira, from Mihir. They've asked, while race may be reduced, a reduced factor in Indian Ocean slave trade, did tribal and religious orders then play a bigger part? I'm thinking of caste, for example. Um, so I would actually start by referring you to some of the other sources around Indian Ocean um, slavery. So particularly the work of um, uh, Ned Alpers is really integral here. And um, I would say that the period that they're looking at is probably before um, the consolidation of caste through imperial kind of uh, hierarchies. Of course, caste has always been important. Um, but one of the effects of the bits that I do know about, and this is the sort of British engagement in the Indian Ocean, is that one of the um, punishments that people used in the British Empire was prisoner transportation. So you'd be um, uh, transported or deported to somewhere like Mauritius to work out your sentence. And one of the effects of transportation, particularly having to be transported in the ships and under the conditions that you were transported is essentially you lost your caste privileges and status because you were suddenly mixing with people that you shouldn't have been mixing with, your uh, food became impure, your um, religious rituals could not be followed. So one of the terrors, if you like, of prisoner transportation in this, in this period was the, um, was the loss of caste, right? That was kind of idea of social death. In the Indian Ocean slavery system, the sort of um, one facilitated uh, outside European rule, it's not clear that those categories were as stable, um, but that's a very big generalization. I think you'd have to look at the specific communities to understand how that was working. So for example, the Afro-descended populations in um, Western India or in Sri Lanka do experience racialized and caste-based discrimination, even though they're old populations that were settled for a longer time. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I think you've actually got a few more questions. Um, <laughs> um, so this one is from Benkney, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And um, they've asked, they've said, thank you for your distinction between imperialism and colonialism. Um, but there is always a history of racism and one with a lack of definition. Can it be confined to white racism? 
um, and then they continue. So you can feel free to answer which other questions. Um, what are the Cromwell's forced migration of Irish as indentured servants? What are the Quaker and evangelical reactions to slavery on the grounds of humanity? What is scientific racism? When we live in its legacy, giving us spectacles by which we ana anachronistically view all the past. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to think about there, and I'm sure um, if anyone else would like to jump in, feel free. Okay, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll kick off um, if you want me to. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so yes, yeah, so I mean, we speak in broad terms about uh, racism as a sort of modern, modern system of ordering people. Um, and most people who work on race would distinguish between generalized forms of xenophobia and racism as a particular kind of system of ranking um, and that becomes connected to the idea of species that connected to the idea of um, uh, color as the sort of major kind of marker of race and uh, so on. So these studies I think are able to account for the ways in which particular groups become attached to particular outcomes. So one of the most famous works in critical race studies is uh, Ignatieff's How the Irish Became White, right? And so it deals with the racialization of the Irish by the English as part of the process of, colon of colonizing Ireland um, and what happens to the Irish when they become part of the new world order. So of course, many um, white people were brought as indentured slaves to the new world um, as well. And sorry, indentured laborers uh, to the new world as well. Um, and many of them were able to come out of their um, indenture either themselves or in future generations. And then they became part of and recognized by the state as white. So race is not real in that sense, right? It's about how you are recognized. And at certain points at time, the Irish were recognized as white and certain times they weren't. And that was indexed to their social power and their economic power. There is absolutely, I would agree with the questioner, a danger of trans transfixing the idea of race and using that to read back into different situations where it wasn't applicable. Um, and I think there's a difficulty with talking about race in many ways because what people understand in everyday sense as racism and what, if you like, the historical sociologists understand as modern racism are not necessarily uh, equivalent. Um, so when I'm speaking, I'm talking more about the sense of this kind of structural character to empire and, and so on. I'm not sure that quite answers the question, but I hope it does. I mean. Mostly, I just want to underscore that um, uh, just because things happened through racialized categories and they were justified through racialized categories doesn't mean either that, that there weren't other forms of violence which were very violent, right? The, the Irish famine and the deaths that ensued through that um, were very significant. But that doesn't mean that race always means what it meant at a particular time. Like one of the reasons why the Irish are allowed to die is because they are racialized as lesser humans, right? They're understood as being less important to save. Wonderful, thank you. I think that answers, um, there's quite a few questions there, so I think you answered that really brilliantly. Would, um, would any of the other panelists like to step in? I know it's quite a broad topic and perhaps not as rooted in um, the discussion we've had so far, but if you have any comments, just feel free. Yeah, I think um, Miriam makes a really good point about how, um, you know, one kind of system of oppression doesn't kind of minimise another. And again, and also that, you know, that often these kind of like racialized dynamics do come into these systems of oppression. So that, that's a really, I thought that was a really good answer. Thank you, Mira. Sadia, were you? I saw you unmuted at one point. Were you yeah, um, I think like I'm. I'm looking at some of the discussion on um, the YouTube comments, um, and um, uh, just to kind of chime in with Mira that you know one kind of oppression doesn't have to mean that a different one wasn't happening at the same time. Um, I mean, one of the questions about the oppression of white people in history. Um, so I, I do think that there's a lot to say about um, the way that we have developed our uh, uh, conceptualization, whether it's post-colonial studies um, uh, about um, our, our feminism, about intersectionality, and kind of looking at these different elements and, and, and in, 
injustices of um, oppression. And I think like what what we're what I'm at least saying in the context of partition in India and Pakistan is not that you know all of the problems that exist today between India and Pakistan are because of colonial rule. That that's not it. There are many problems that exist that you know. Um, consists of that we can explain from different categories of analysis not just race it's also about uh, religion gender there's many other categories that we need to analyze to understand the current standoff between india and pakistan and how othering happens and what what it, we're not talking about one overarching idea of what othering is you know it's 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 different in different communities and it has to be constantly reframed when we're talking about different cases so i think the 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 separation of uh, of india and pakistan in 1947 of course it has links in how colonization happened um the fact that uh, kind of india was united by um the british is is a very uh, you know uh, that did happen, but did that happen without oppression or ideas of race or the administrative um, uh, logic behind um, the way uh, Britain kind of switched from being the East India Company to to uh, the British Raj and, and uh, the the official administrative government governance of of this territory. So I think it's, it's again, it's a very complex discussion if we're talking about whether we're talking about race, if we're talking about class, caste, gender in, in South Asia. And I think we do have to take it case by case, especially if we reach kind of modern times of we're talking about, if we're talking about the Congress versus the Muslim League, what were the aims of the Muslim League at the time, you know, I, this is probably a topic for a very long conference on on uh, South Asia and migration and uh, colonialism. But I think it has to be taken case by case. It doesn't mean that we're absolving governments or locals or local systems of powers from how uh, oppression that came out of, of colonialism was compounded on and exists today. Um, even if you look at the histories of South Asian peoples, it's not that everything is okay. There is still situations of mass poverty, et cetera. And the, the lives of people in some of these third world countries, these less developed countries are, we cannot actually compare them to, you know, the lives of, of uh, white Europeans. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very difficult, um, um, comparison to make and I don't think we should be making it um, and I think when we are talking about uh, colonialism and forced migration and the experiences of, of migrants I think let's stick here in this conversation because then there's, there's many other spaces for those to have those other conversations about other types of oppression um, and and again I think people that are in in my field at least are kind of also open to those those conversations of other types of oppressions but I think we at least I as as somebody who's studying did South Asian studies and is working in this field right now I only have the capacity to focus on this problem and kind of uh, kind of impact this space. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, definitely, I think, you know, even we at Common Ground, we discuss, you know, you know, how how much can we get done in terms of decolonizing university, like what methods can we use, how much can we tackle and do it well? Um, and so I think that's definitely, obviously, like a broader awareness of all these different caveats and intersections are so crucial. But at the same time, you know, we've particularly felt with our activist work that there are sometimes you have to focus on one goal just to be able to like get the energy and momentum up for that thing. And you're not kind of, you know, trying to reduce other issues. Um, but yeah, it's about kind of like using your energy efficiently um, and stuff like that. So um, we've had a lot of comments, um, but it seems to be kind of like debates within the YouTube <laughs> um, on the um, comment section. So um, I was thinking of just personally maybe like asking Jess um, if you could kind of tell us a bit more about how the university and um, whether they've like colleges have been receptive to um, the work of STAR, how like perhaps other students and as it seen like in the wider student community. Um, yeah, if you could enlighten us maybe into that. Yeah, sure thing. So um, STAR is sort of fairly new at the moment because it stopped running for a while at Oxford. So we started it back up um, in Michaelmas. And I think such a massive thing for us was just getting the word out. And that's why earlier I sort of mentioned like the importance of spreading the word amongst students and students getting involved in these conversations because we found that was the most pressing thing for us for the first two terms, I'd say. Um, in general, though, it's been really great to see the reception, not only of like different colleges, but also of the wider community to STAR. So 
when we had um, preliminary meetings with Asylum Welcome and also with Mansfield and Somerville because they're leading the University of Sanctuary campaign, um, it was sort of this common theme that they were really, really happy to have um, a group of students who could sort of provide for, for charities like Asylum Welcome, this, this link to a body of students and potential volunteers is, is really important and can make a huge difference. And for the colleges, again, um, I was actually surprised about how much student engagement really, really does matter. And the directors of development were telling us that it's having students behind you, which can give you so much power in coming to the university. Um, so I think it was really, really great to hear that um, having a body of students can make such a difference. And I think it's been really, really lovely to see that a lot of students are really interested in STAR. So we're just hoping to keep up the campaigning and things like that. I think COVID does inevitably make it a lot harder, especially because I think such a central part of campaigning and all this and supporting refugees, I think is, is community. Um, when I was younger, we did like community meetings and they were by far, I'd say the most beneficial thing that we did where we just chat to people and see what was bothering them and see how we could help in these like tiny, like day-to-day -day ways. And I think it is sad to sort of lose that a bit with COVID, but I'm really looking forward to when this all lifts and to have some really like meaningful discussions with people and to sort of bring the conversations from Zoom into real life should be really nice. Yeah, that's so wonderful to hear that you've had such a positive reception. I mean, yeah, I think the work that you've been doing is excellent. And yeah, I'm very looking forward to the future of Star at Oxford. <laughs> um, Maya, did you have any questions? To ask the panellists, don't worry, if not, we can close it off earlier. Um, I, don't, I don't think so at the moment, but I, I just want to say that I totally agree, Jess, and I'm also really excited for kind of things opening up and moving on. I think... Um, especially when you're kind of trying to apply political pressure and like lobbying, um, you know, having, you know, rallies and kind of in-person events is really powerful for kind of demonstrating collective um, opinion and action and, you know, showing the university or whatever institution you're working with um, kind of the force behind the action you're trying to take. Uh, but then I also really do admire the way that, um, you know, both like Project Dust Done and Star have been trying to adapt and, you know, kind of flexibly work around the COVID restrictions. You've been doing really great work and also kind of with social media. Um, it's looking fantastic. Uh, so once we do start up again, there'll be like a kind of massive bank of people behind us. Um, yeah, I don't have any questions at the moment. I think it might be all right to kind of finish up a little early if, um, or if Mira, if you have some thoughts, I'd love to. Oh, I only, um, I just wanted to flag something which we hadn't really touched on when talking about forced migration. We've mostly been talking about refugees um, escaping war. What we haven't really talked upon is um, uh, sex trafficking, trafficking of children um, and modern slavery, actually all of which are in and of themselves enormous phenomena that need um, unpicking and unpacking. And of course, lots of them lots of these things happen and people are, become vulnerable to them when they are fleeing other situations and then they become vulnerable to all these other sort of forms of predation. So um, that's a much bigger conversation, um, but it's something which is harder in many respects to, to see and to rally around. Um, refugees at least become visible in camps, they become visible for engagement, but people who are subject to trafficking are often then subsequently imprisoned, either in private households or in, in other areas. And so it seems more difficult to, to take action on it. And so it might be worth kind of exploring how universities and students can at least educate themselves about this particular situation and the extent to which it is in our neighborhoods and in our in our lives um, and how it shapes the landscape that we depend on. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up actually. Yeah, I hadn't really even considered when we were discussing. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think, you know, as you just said, like, you know, students, community can be so powerful in these things. So like getting an awareness and understanding for things that are more subtle, perhaps not as easy visible as you said, is, is really crucial. Um, so I'll just do one final call. Um, if anyone who's watching has any more questions, like please just pop them in the comments. But um, if not, I'll, um, I'll just want to say like, thank you so much um, for our panelists today. Um, I've, I've learned so much and I've really enjoyed what seems to be like a really fruitful discussion. Um, and it's actually left me feeling quite positive. Um, about you know activism movements and alternative ways of you know 
dealing with the suffering and stress of post-migration just getting a better understanding a more holistic view of lived and kind of you know historical um experiences so yeah um i don't think there are any more questions so i'll i'll pass over back to them thank you very much alice has left me feeling very positive as well it's fantastic to see so much student activism going on and i think it's a really brilliant finale um, to the series to have that sense of Oxford kind of looking out and I think students are very much the cutting edge of, of academia and of the university and uh, it's brilliant to, to see the panel you put together and um, I thought the discussion work was brilliant and the, the format was really uh, good as well. Um, so yeah, so that, that is the end of the series then. So uh, thank you very much in particular everyone for listening um, and for taking part in the conversations and for coming along every week and, and uh, hearing what's going on um, in the Oxford and Empire Network. I mean, the, the aim of the network really is to sort of start a conversation going and hopefully that's um, happened and that you're all feeling energised to go on and um, continue thinking about these issues. And obviously the Oxford and Empire Network is continuing, so we'll be hoping to put on um, other events and all of the talks in the series or all the panels in the series um, are now up and available on the website. So do put kind of listen to those again, so go back and look at them and refer other people to them. I think it's going to be a good resource to have up there um, for the future. Okay, so thank you very much again and bye for now. <laughs>